Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you gave your apostles grace truly to believe and to preach your word. Grant that we might love what they believed and preach what they taught. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So uh, before we tuck in, I just want to um, take a minute to tell you what a fan of your rector I am. Uh, I really, I like Hamilton a lot. He is an incredibly gifted guy. Um, Beth and I, in, in sort of the roles that we play in the life of the diocese, we go around church after church, week after week, and it's very common that people say, uh, to us, you know, I just want you to know I pray for you, I just want you to know I pray for you, which means the world to us. Um, your rector, it's probably maybe a, once a month, maybe a little more frequently than that, we, both Beth and I will get an email from it. You, you, I see nods, like you know this. Does it to everyone? Oh, well then, never mind. <laughs> so, no. <laughs> but um, it, is, it is so wonderful when I get those messages from him to think, this guy really is praying for us, and he wants to know uh, what's on our hearts and the things, the burdens that we're carrying. Uh, and so I'm just I'm grateful for him. And I don't know if this is a, a very St. Thomas thing to do or not, but um, I hope and trust that you appreciate your rector as much as I do. So if you would show your appreciation uh, to him with me. Um, <laughs> So a, a few months ago, I think it was a couple months ago, my wife Beth and her mom, my mother-in-law, um, were having this conversation together about humor. And I, I can't remember exactly how it went. I'm, I'm sort of telling her story, so I, I beg your grace if I get some of the details wrong. Um, but I think my son John, uh, our son number two, his wife uh, is here uh, and her dad, so welcome to you guys, glad that you're here. Amanda, she also brought my grandson Jack. Jacksy is in the nursery right now. Yay. Um, <laughs> anyway, I think the conversation was about John, right? And, and my mother-in-law said to Beth, she said, you know, John is really, what? she said smart, right? She said, he's really smart. And Beth said, well, you know, why do you say that? She said, well, because he's funny. So funny and smart. And, and Beth says, well, yeah, I mean, all funny people are smart. And her mother said, well, I'm smart, but I'm not funny. And Beth said, well, okay, all funny people are smart, but not necessarily all smart people are funny. Right? Now, I, I tell that um, to, to sort of set up the idea of smartness. And, and, and to go into, so does anybody know of the comedian Nate Bargatze? Yes. Oh, yeah. I love Nate Bargatze. I, like, he just kills me. He is so funny. Um, and the thing about Nate Bargatze is he's not smart. At least, I mean, he says he's not smart. And it's true, like he struggled through high school. He, he did just enough of a, a junior college kind of thing to decide that that was not for him. Um, he talks about how he's not smart and all that, but if you listen to his comedy, if you, if you both in, in individual jokes, but also the way that he puts them together into a comedy show, you know that although he's not formally educated in the same way, he doesn't have a degree, he, the guy's brilliant. The guy is brilliant. Um, and and what, what I want to kind of highlight for us, because this is important for this little gospel story that we read this morning, I want to highlight for us that we have certain notions, certain ideas, certain prejudices even, as we, in, as we think about smart in the world around us. So for instance, uh, as a rule, this is not true of us because we're here in the South, but as a, as a rule, people will tell you that if you have a Southern accent, you're probably not smart, right? I mean, that's just the assumption. Like you go off you know, to, to be a news telecaster or something like that, and they're going to try to do everything they can to, to at least calm your southern accent down. Uh, because they believe that if you talk with a heavy southern accent, you're dumb. Um, if you have a GED instead of a high school diploma, you're not smart. That's just the assumption. Uh, if you didn't go to college, you're not smart. And then C.S. Lewis alerted us to another, and I think this is an important one, uh, a version of not smart that we all kind of hold, and that is what Lewis called chronological snobbery. 
So Lewis says, we believe that people who lived a long time ago simply cannot be as smart as we are. And we confuse sort of the total amount of available data or something like that with smartness. He calls it chronological snobbery. And, and if we have that, and we're looking at Mark's gospel, as we, you, you all are working your way through Mark's gospel this year, and, and we're, this morning, we're going to do our part looking at this great story from Mark chapter 7. Um, but if we're not aware of how smart Mark is, and Mark was incredibly young, uh, probably the youngest of the disciples. There are any number of little hints and clues throughout the New Testament that suggest that to us. Um, we know that it's, it's true of all of the disciples that they didn't go through the kind of the educational system that the Jews had set up in the first century. Um, it was one of those systems where if you did well at one part, then you got invited by a teacher to go on to the next part. And if you did well in that part, you got invited to go on to the next part. And all of Jesus' disciples were doing other things when he called them. They were not in school. Um, so, so we have this sort of sense. And, and plus, I mean, Mark lived, what, 2,000 years ago. He didn't know how to use an iPad. Um, he, he, you know, he could not have made his way in the world. So we just think Mark is not that bright. But this story shows what an amazing storyteller Mark is. And when Mark sits down to pen his gospel, the complexities, the, the nuances, the way that he... Uh, includes things and, and returns to themes over and over and over again, all point us towards the fact that um, he is a master at telling a story and by making sure that we have the details that are necessary to know what we need to know um, about the story that, of Jesus that he's telling. So, if you're familiar at all with the story that Mark told us this morning, the, the, the story uh, of the Syrophoenician woman uh, who comes to Jesus begging him that he would heal her daughter. If you're familiar with it, chances are you've heard about it through sort of contemporary explications of it in, in which lately you often hear people saying that Jesus does not come off looking very good in this story. Right? What happens is the woman comes to Jesus and she basically begs him to heal her daughter, her daughter who is beset by an unclean spirit, a, a demon. And, and Jesus says to her simply, the children get fed first. Don't throw children's bread to the dogs. Seriously? I mean, this woman comes and says, Jesus, my daughter is beset by a demon. And he says, at least this is the way we sort of spin it, he says like, go on little dog, don't bother me. I'm here for the children. And we are aghast. One, that Jesus would be so callous and, and dismissive of her. But second, this slur, I mean, does he deserve to be canceled? I mean, in our day, Jesus would probably get canceled for this. But I think that if that's what you see in this story, you have missed everything that Mark is trying to tell us about Jesus with this story. So, um, we will get to this interaction between Jesus and this woman, and the, and the, you know, does he, is it a slur or not? But in order to get there, I think we need to tuck in. We need to just get our grounding in Mark's gospel. So here's the first thing that's important to know that Mark is doing as he's writing his whole gospel, and this chapter 7, verses 24 through 30, fits into it really beautifully, that Mark is two sections. There's two big questions that Mark is asking and answering in his gospel. The first question, which is about the first eight chapters of Mark's gospel, is simply, who is Jesus? And so Mark tells us any number of stories trying to help us come to see what he has come to see in Jesus, answering the question, who is Jesus? And that part of the gospel culminates in Mark chapter 8, where Jesus takes his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, um, and he asks them, who do people say that I am? So he's, he's getting right to the heart of the matter. Who do they say that I am? And they say, well, some people say you're a great prophet. Some people say that you're Elijah. Some people say that you're a great teacher. And then Jesus points the question at the disciples directly. Who do you say? that I am. And Peter answers on behalf of the disciples, 
we believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And with that, the curtain closes on Act 1 of Mark's Gospel, Who is Jesus? Now, it's chapters 8 and 9, kind of our, our transition between Act 1 and Act 2, because Act 2 asks the question, that if Act 1 is the question, who is Jesus? The answer is he's the Messiah. Act 2, chapters 9 through the end of the Gospel, chapter 16, is how is he the Messiah? What, what does he do to be the Messiah? And, concomitant question with that, what does it mean to belong to him? What does it mean to be his disciple? The answer to the first question, how is he the Messiah, is the cross. He's the Messiah by going to Jerusalem and suffering and dying. The answer to the second question is the same answer. How are we supposed to follow him? Jesus says, take up the cross and follow me. My Messiahship consists in suffering and dying for the world. Your following consists in your suffering and dying to yourself in order to be mine and to follow me. So that's the big structure. And so this little story, the story of the Syrophoenician woman, Mark chapter 7, fits right into what Mark is trying to do in the first part, Act 1 of his Gospel, which is this story teaches us a lot about who Jesus is, if we'll just listen. So here are some important details that Mark gives that we might miss. The first is that he says, from there, he arose and went away into the region of Tyre and Sidon. This is the first time in the gospel story that Jesus steps foot outside of the region of Galilee. So everything that's happened up to this point has, if you will, been on home turf. Right? Everything so far has been in and amongst Jesus' own people. And he goes from home turf to sort of foreign soil, if you will. He goes to get away. He goes to remove himself. And the place that he goes um, is not just any ordinary place. It's, this is a place of a long history of trouble and animosity between, between peoples, and, and there's antipathy with the folks that live there and the folks that live in the region of the Galilee. Um, in that long history, this is just an example, um, one, of the, one of the most sinister figures of the entire Old Testament story is an evil queen Jezebel. And Jezebel came from this town. So Jesus goes to the place, he leaves his home turf and he goes to the place where none other than Jezebel was from. And so if you are reading this story along with Mark, you're thinking, what in, the, why would he go there? I mean, today, this is the area that right now is being bombed. This is, this is where Hezbollah is. Right? The, the antipathy continues. That's where Jesus goes. What does he go to do? He goes to get away. Now, is that all he goes to do? I think we'll find out as the story unfolds that there may be more to it than that. But Jesus goes. He makes his first venture. That is to say, Jesus is reaching out to people unlike himself not his own. And in, the, in doing that, what he's doing is he's beginning to show us that what was promised from the very earliest days of God's dealing with his people Israel, particularly in the person of Abraham, what God said then is being accomplished now. So if you remember, God calls Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, and he says, I want you to go to a place and I'm going to make, he says it to Abraham, a 75-year-old man with no children, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And then he says, and I'm going to bless you. And then he says, and through you all the nations of the world, even the nasty ones, will be blessed. So when Jesus steps foot out of the Galilee region and goes into Tyre and Sidon, we're getting a hint that that long-promised reality is beginning to come true. So that's one of the most important details, that this is a, a kind of a first move in the fulfillment of a great long promise. And that brings us to another one of Mark's really sort of brilliant maneuvers, what it, New Testament scholars call when they study the book of Mark, they call the messianic secret. Right In Mark's gospel, oftentimes Jesus will do something really spectacular, and then he says, don't tell anybody. Or 
Or somebody will make a proclamation. You know, they'll say, ah, you know, you are the Lord. And he goes, shh, keep quiet. That, that's, that doesn't make any sense to us. Unless you understand what Mark is doing and you understand that coming to know who Jesus is might be compromised if you don't understand how he's doing what he's doing. Because everybody has in their notion, in their mind, a notion of what the Messiah ought to be. So whoever you think is like your saving grace out in the world, and that may be alcohol, it may be money, it may be drugs, it may be a new car, it may be your job, it may be your looks, it may be whatever. But, but you have this notion that that thing can do for you what you want it to do. And, and Mark knows, Jesus knows, that if people come to know him as the Messiah, what they're going to come to know, what they're going to come to think, is that what he will do for them is simply what they want him to do. For them. So he says, hold on. Don't go there yet until you get the whole picture. When you get the whole picture, then start proclaiming it to the whole world. But if you don't know part two, act two, how, then who doesn't really matter very much. So this messianic secret is also going on here because we're told that he goes up there in quietness, to be away, to be removed, to step back. So, so we come to another interesting moment in this strange territory of Tyre and Sidon, Jesus meets a woman. Now this is amazing if you live in this time and era. Right? No matter, you know, we, we live in a world where there's all kinds of confusions and, and, and craziness over gender roles and all that sort of stuff. And, and I don't care, like, I don't care what sort of, like, radically traditional, you know, you think that the mom is supposed to be at home with a flowery dress on, just baking bread all day and, and raising 17 children or, or whatever. Like, I don't care what your view of, you know, if you think that that's an oppressive view of women, it is nothing compared to the view of women in the first century. And that Jesus would go, but this is the first time he ventures out. The first person that he goes to is a woman. It happens all over the New Testament in, in the Gospels. So there's this the time that Jesus goes into Samaria, who's the first person that he meets, the woman at the well. He's crucified, and, and he rises again. Who are the first people that know? Women. So, so Mark is showing us that something, it, it, this is not just regular old life in the first century that's unfolding in this story. Something amazing is happening here. Jesus venture into foreign territory then. Is it just a kind of a getaway for a nap and some quiet? Or is there a purpose? And in this purpose, does this, of all people, woman, play a significant role? And then this is a clue about the woman. Mark's favorite word happens 49 times in his gospel. His favorite word is a little word that gets translated for us immediately. Right? You read Mark's gospel, and it's like immediately Jesus did this, and then immediately did that, and then immediately he did this. And it creates this kind of sense of like, you know, the action is really happening. It's, it's one thing to the next. It's urgency and all that kind of stuff. 49 times in Mark's gospel, um, we hear this word immediately. 38 of the 49, all but 11, are in part one, the, the question of who. So Mark is teaching us something about who Jesus is with this little word immediately. The other times are in the second section, and of those remaining, about seven of them apply to his disciples, right? But most of them are directed towards Jesus. Now, when we, like I've said, when we hear the word immediately, we think next thing, quickly. That's only the surface level of what Mark has going on here. And so I'm going to have to ask you to grammar up a bit with me to, to, to sort of go with me on this part. But the word that's translated immediately is the little Greek word euthis. And euthis is a, it's a compound word. The first part, the, the, um, preface, uh, the prefix, you, means good. So a eulogy is a good word, a euthis, good. And the this part is... Um, the passive something or another, I don't even know all the 
tense of the word to place. So the, the Greek word is tithemi. So it's a good placement. But it's passive. So it's being good placed. I think what Mark is doing with this little word, when he says, then immediately Jesus did this, and then immediately Jesus did that, and then immediately Jesus did this, is not just saying, boy, Jesus was busy. But it's saying everything that Jesus did found him in the position that he was supposed to be in, placed under, in a good way, the will of his Father. What does Jesus say about himself in John's Gospel? He says, truly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. And so when Mark says, immediately, what he's saying is that Jesus is doing exactly what Jesus is supposed to do as the agent of the Father who is in the world to redeem the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, immediately means that this thing is going right according to its purpose. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. This is an amazing thing. Of the 49 occurrences of Euthus in the Gospels, only seven of them don't refer to Jesus. They refer to the disciples. And only one, only one, doesn't refer to, only one refers to a Gentile. Only one refers to a woman. That's this one here. So Mark is trying to tell us that this woman is placed exactly where she's supposed to be placed, under the power of the, of the Holy Spirit. She's there doing what God wants her to do. She's meeting Jesus. So Jesus goes to Tyre and Sidon, not just to get away, but because there is a divine appointment between him and this woman that is important first to who Jesus really is. We're going to get a picture of who Jesus really is. But second to who he is as the redeemer of the whole world. So, he goes to Tyre and Sidon. He meets a woman who is clearly under the direction and influence. She's right where she's supposed to be doing exactly what the Lord wants her to do. But what does she bring to Jesus? She brings him a problem of this conflict between Jesus, the Lord of the universe, and what Paul would later call the principalities and the powers. She has a daughter who has an unclean spirit, which is to say a demon. Those two words, unclean spirit and demon, they kind of uh, occur back and forth in the Gospels. They always mean the exact same thing. And so I think that now we're in the heart of Mark's strategy as he's trying to convince us who Jesus really is. All of the Gospel accounts, Mark is no exception, all of the gospel accounts demonstrate that Jesus is Lord over everything. He has authority over everything. We're shown that he has authority even over the Torah, the, the law that, that, that God used Moses to give to his people. Jesus can have authority over that. We see that Jesus has authority over the creation. He can make bread into more bread. He can make storms still. We see that Jesus has power over people. He can make blind people see. He can make um, deaf people hear. And Mark wants us to see that Jesus' power extends even over. He is over the powers of darkness and the forces of evil. Mark, more than any one of the other gospel writers, writers depicts this war between Jesus and the unseen forces, what Paul calls the principalities and powers. But here's an interesting thing about Mark, and this is true, I think, of all the gospel writers. You'd have to check it out, but I think that this is right. Although Jesus frequently confronts unclean spirits and the demons, he never really attends to them. So in this battle between good and evil, what you don't see is a battle. Right? You, you see Jesus sort of almost being dismissive of. You know, when he talks to unclean spirits, almost always what he says is, shut up and get out of here. I got no time for you. You don't have any power. You're, you're not important anymore. Your day is done because I'm here. And, and so when this young woman comes to Jesus and she says, here's my problem. My daughter is possessed by this demon. It is amazing how little Jesus seems to care. 
Right? It's a huge problem for her. It's not that big of a problem if you're Jesus. Right? And, and when the story revol- resolves finally at the end, he simply goes, oh yeah, by the way, I took care of that. You can go home. It's done. He doesn't have to like get water and oil and salt and whatever and you know put stuff around his neck and get ready to go in and you know get himself all prayed up and everything. He just goes, yeah, I took care of that. That's got nothing for me. So Mark is showing us in this story the amazing power that Jesus has over everything. This is who Jesus is. So, the exchange between Jesus and this Syrophoenician woman. I mean, it feels so testy. It feels so dismissive to us. We read it in terms of our sort of common sensibilities, and we think, Jesus, you're awful. Well, I just want to tell you a story. that I, This happened to me. I was the canon of the cathedral in Orlando, Florida, way back in the... 90s. Look, as I look around the congregation, not many of you were even born back then. Um, but um, this is a long time ago. We had we had a guest at the cathedral who was a, a member of a of an evangelistic group called Jews for Jesus. He had become he was a Jew. He'd become a Christian, and he was now evangelizing other Jews. And I remember going to dinner with him and a friend of his, another Jew who was not a Messianic Jew. He hadn't given his life to Jesus. And he set up this appointment, invited me to go along just for the sake of trying to convert his friend. So the whole conversation at dinner that night was over um, who Jesus was. Now, here's the interesting thing. He ordered a cheeseburger. That's actually funny if you know the Torah. Like, you're not supposed to blend meat and cheese. And anyway, all right. So he orders a cheeseburger. I think it was sort of a, he, he sort of like puts his trump card on the table right from the beginning. Um, he did tell me later he didn't like it at all. It was the first time he'd eaten a cheeseburger and he thought it was disgusting. Um, but but as, that unevening, as that evening unfolded, like I was aghast at the way they talked to each other. I mean, it was full frontal, high velocity assault. Like they were calling each other names. They were belittling each other. They were going at it hammer and tongs and having a great time. Like neither one was offended. <laughs> They loved it. They had sleeves rolled up. I mean, it was, it was fantastic. And then when we finished, I don't think the other guy became a Christian, but when we finished, they like hugged each other. So glad to see you. It was fantastic. And I'm sitting there going like, what just happened? Like, if I talked that way to my friends, they wouldn't be my friends anymore. But it was just a whole different world. So I think that the contemporary criticism is just unfounded because we don't understand the cultural givens the way that people interacted and the way that people talked. Here's the thing about her. She is not put off at all. In fact, she comes back. You know, Jesus says, hey, the bread is for the kids, not for the dogs. And she says, oh, yeah. But Jesus, we, even we get some crumbs. Please, Jesus. And he looks at this woman. And, 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 and he loves her. And he affirms her faith. And in this, in this critical story, in the unfolding drama of who Jesus really is, he is the light to enlighten the nations and the glory of his people Israel, Lord over even the forces of darkness and evil, able to heal and deliver his people from all oppression. What we see in this story is a woman who is the model of what it is to be a follower of Jesus. We see in the most unlikely place that Mark could possibly present to us, exactly what Jesus is looking for. We see in this story, filled with small but important details, if we know what we're looking for, if we appreciate how smart Mark is and how great he is at doing his job of telling the story of Jesus, we see what real humility, what patience, what perseverance, and mostly what faith actually looks like. And we say, along with her, in the way that we say it in our liturgy, Lord, we're not worthy even to gather up the crumbs from under your table. But you're the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. What the Syrophoenician woman learned what Jesus taught, what Jesus showed, what Jesus demonstrated, is that it is care always to have mercy. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.